Welcome back to Today in Atlanta Sports. I'm sorry for the delay on this episode because obviously a ton has happened, but Friday happened, and I feel like this was a sign that bad news was coming. I just spilled a whole 16-ounce thing of coffee that I was actually really excited to drink. So not only did I not get the coffee, I spilled it all over my computer. So I'm borrowing a computer, but thank God I have it. We're back. We're able to shoot this episode. A ton of shit's happened. Deshaun Watson, we were basically penciling him in, had you know pictures of him in Falcons gear, ready for him to come to Atlanta. You know, the guy comes back home. It's going to be a great story, blah, blah, blah. You know, all the negative PR aside, you know, it's going to be a great story. He gets this major deal. The Browns basically just whip out this elephant deal out of nowhere, 230 million guaranteed, essentially over four years, because the first year when he's likely to be suspended, they made it a $1 million uh, contract. So basically he's going to get all that money guaranteed over four seasons, largest guaranteed deal by a mile, uh, he'll be the highest paid quarterback by a mile over those four seasons. Uh, it's just, it's honestly an absurd deal. So you kind of understand why the Falcons all sat on it, especially since like, I don't even know if I wanted the Falcons to do that. Like maybe I did because like, then everything else was going to happen. Then Matt Ryan's going to go, then you're in this weird situation, blah, blah, blah. And you know, everything's screwed. So out of desperation, but that's, that's a desperation deal by the Browns, honestly, four years, $230 million. Uh, if something were to happen to Sean Watson or who knows what happens with these legal cases, uh, you know, they, they're, they're going to be completely screwed. So desperation deal there. Uh, the Falcons end up getting screwed. Then they trade Matt Ryan. Um, it's really just a sad day. I have to say, like, I don't usually get super. I wasn't really super emotional when Julio left because the way it happened, like him going on air, like, and honestly, he just never really was a boisterous presence. Um, in Atlanta, you know, he was a well represented, but but not really in the community like that. You know, Matt's been kind of like the leader of Atlanta sports for 15 years. And to see him go um, in a classy way, you know, didn't make didn't go out like Baker Mayfield demanding a trade publicly, blah, blah, blah. Uh, it's it's definitely it's definitely sad. Um, and from a football perspective, it's full, it's full rebuild time. I mean, this team's going to be awful next year. They signed Marcus Mariota, which almost is a bad thing because they could win a game or two. Uh, so, but it, it's rebuild time. It's, it's reflect self-reflection time. And Hey, Terry Fontenot and Arthur Smith have their opportunity to finally build this thing from the ground up. Like they should have done last year. Yeah. The Browns basically were backed into a corner after they, um, it was reported that they were out of the Deshaun Watson sweepstakes uh, but then they really went back to Baker and Baker was like, I'm out of here, you know, I'm done. And so really they were like, all right, well, we, you know, the Haslam's were like, we got to woo Deshaun Watson with money, I guess. Uh, Cause that's what we can do. And they did. Uh, I think the highest guaranteed money was Aaron Rodgers, like 151 million. And he set the record by like 1 million. And Deshaun Watson just broke that 150 million by 80, 80 million dollars. <laughs> yeah. I mean, over four the, years too. Yeah, over four years. So I mean, it's the, an absurd deal. Yeah, the Browns really did pull out all the stops. Uh, you know, I, that's not a good. That's not good business. Uh, so Falcons fans can be upset about not landing Deshaun Watson, or be happy that they uh, didn't land Deshaun Watson. But either way, uh, what the Browns did is bad business because um, you don't know what's going to happen. Uh, yeah, they ground. They did brown things. Watson Watson has an injury history, and it's not like he's you know susceptible to injuries, but he's had a significant injury or two during his time in Houston and uh, with Clemson. It's just sad all around that you know we couldn't have a, a proper farewell for somebody of Matt Ryan's caliber. I mean, he he's pretty much been the entire Falcons organizations for the better part of my entire life. Uh, he's really all I've known. I, I remember the end of Mike Vick, but, you know, Matt Ryan's been it for me personally. Um, and he's done nothing but show up, work his ass off, and just be a good guy. Like, it's it's like nowadays it's, like, lame to be a good guy as a quarterback in the NFL. Like, Baker Mayfield's just a unreliable child. I mean, the it is hilarious. The Browns were like, we don't want – we want an adult as a quarterback. I mean, what a slap in the face to Baker Mayfield. That Whoa. guy's stock has never been lower. Oh, They're going to have to give somebody a third round pick just to take them. I mean, yeah. shit show for Baker Mayfield, but yeah, super sad, uh, you know, shit show for the Falcons too. I mean, this is really, they had to trade Matt Ryan. I mean, there was nothing they were going to do. 
Uh, they had to trade him. And what's even more surprising, even through all this, Matt Ryan was still like, yeah, I'm, I might come back I and know. play for the Falcons. That's the crazy part. Convinced. He had to be convinced to stay and, or, you know, to go to another team. You know, Terry Fontenot, they, they allowed the Colts to talk to him and convince him, get, go with the GM Ballard and, and Reich and all of them and, and give him their whole plan to basically convince Ryan to come. I mean, he still wanted to stay in Atlanta, which is just a testament to everything Matt Ryan's meant to this city. And then you mentioned the Vic days. I mean, I can go back to a story just to really, because this is where the whole Matt Ryan era started, was actually two years before when Michael Vick got that big $100 million contract, then got suspended for dogfighting, went to federal prison, was completely released from his contract. You have the Byron left, which Joey Harrington, Bobby Petrino uh, era next, which was just the the downfall of the worst, you know, the rock bottom of Falcons football. And Matt Ryan came. And it's funny because when Matt Ryan came, you know, it was an argument over getting Glenn Dorsey out of LSU, who was an LSU great, turned out not to have a very good NFL career or Matt Ryan. And a lot of people wanted, were arguing for Glenn Dorsey. You know, Falcons fans didn't want Matt Ryan. And it was kind of foreshadowing what would happen over his entire career. Probably the most polar, for no reason, the most polarizing yeah. The dude is Atlanta so sports straight and narrow and everybody's yeah. like acting like he's this polarizing figure. But, but like, that's what he was as far as the fan base, the Falcon fan base, because, because of Vic, because of the way things ended with Vic. And um, it really is just him not wanting to leave Atlanta after all that happened is just a testament to who he was this whole time. You know, just a consummate professional, never let any of that noise get to his head, even if it was negative noise. Um, And I really just hope that he has the success in Indianapolis that we all expect him to. Um, I I view Matt Ryan as a great play action quarterback, even to this day. Uh, He's one of the smartest quarterbacks in the league. Yes. I think he lost a little arm strength. I don't think people are talking about his mobility. Like, bro, the guy's never been mobile. I think he's more mobile now than he ever has been. I don't think, (laughs) but our arm strength is really where, you know, you kind of notice a little bit of regression over his career, but uh, he's never had a great strong arm. He's always been, you know, a, a guy that relies on his brain and, you know, he's been in this league for what, 15 years now. And I expect him to really do well with the Colts. And I'm going to be cheering for the Colts. I mean, this year, you can basically pencil the Falcons in. It's a wash. It's over. Um, I'm almost mad we got Marcus Mariota because we might actually somehow pull out five wins um, if we're well coached. Uh, But that schedule's hard. So there's not going to be any free wins on that schedule. So uh, I guess what's next for the Falcons is you have to just start looking forward to two, three years down the road, which is really what we should have done last offseason rip the bandaid off, get what we could get for Matt Ryan and start thinking about it. Uh, You wrote an article. We could have up to 135, $140 million in cap space next year. So this could get better quickly. I mean, I think the big thing for the Falcons, how fast it gets better is how fast they find that signal caller. Um, That's why I'm not against them going after a Malik Willis or a Kenny Pick. If they like one of those guys, you know, I'm not a QB evaluator, but if they like one of those guys, if they think they can trade back or if they think they like him at eight, uh, it might take a t- couple stabs to find that right guy. Uh, so it doesn't matter how high you draft. I mean, guys that have been drafted one have sucked. Guys who've been drafted, you know, 200th have been the best quarterback of all time. So it's going to take a couple stabs most likely. So I hope they do take a couple stabs, uh, a stab at least early first, second round at a quarterback, uh, see what they can get, see if they can develop, let them sit behind Mariota. Don't throw them into things, see what you got there. And, and they're, this seems going to be bad anyway. So they'll have another a chance um in the first round next uh, season when the quarterback's class is much better. So uh, I think that's really what you're, you're trying to find that next signal caller. And, and then you build around that guy with your 130, $140 million in free agency. Yeah, that's a good point. Uh, rarely ever do teams move off of, you know, one of the greatest players in franchise history and then immediately draft uh, an equal, you know, Uh, somebody who's going to do the same thing. You know, the Packers did it with Brett Favre and Aaron Rodgers. Maybe the Patriots did it with uh, Mac Jones. Uh, But the list is very short, and the odds aren't in the Falcons' favor. You said it. I mean, it's basically throwing darts at a dartboard. You just got to keep throwing them, and you'll hit on one. I mean, I hope. Uh, If you can't, that's that's bad. But, yeah, you just got to keep taking stabs at it, and you might as well take one now. If you if 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 this regime feels strongly about one of those two you just named, I think the consistency is Pickett and um, Willis, Malik Willis are one and two and interchangeable. Uh, you, you just got to do it. I mean, there, there's no, 
you know, maybe we'll wait. Yes, everybody would love Bryce Young or CJ Shroud. It's it's not that I don't want those guys. It's that there's no guarantee the Falcons are going to be in a position to draft one of those two guys. The Lions are looking for a guy. Yeah. The Texans are looking for a guy. The Panthers are looking for a guy. And all three of those teams are sure to be in that top five range. So, you know, there's no guarantee. And just like you said, Marcus Mariota, damn. I mean, he's just good enough where he's going to win five, six games yeah. and keep the Falcons out of contention for those two top guys. But then again, you know, there's no guarantee they work out. They've just, you know, excelled at the co- collegiate level and everybody yeah. thinks that they're it. Uh, so you just got to keep taking stabs at it. I'm in agreement with you that I-, I would be shocked if they didn't come away with a quarterback in this draft in the first two rounds. I- I'll yeah. even go that far. Yeah, I mean, I think you look, I mean, four guys I'm keeping my eyes on um, are, are Ritter and Corral in the second and Pickett and Willis in the first. That, that's those. Maybe they trade back up and end into the first with the extra picks to get, you know, if they think one of those quarterbacks like a Corral or a Ritter that they're that they're eyeing, you know, trade back into the first round to get them. I, I think so, too. And those first 44 picks, I expect them to take a quarterback. I think that's the right decision. And, and even if they don't pan out, I think it's the right decision because, like you said, there's a lot, a lot of these guys. I mean, listen, C.J. Stroud, a ton of physical traits that you love. I watched C.J. Stroud play 15 times last year, pretty much every Ohio State game. The guy's extremely inaccurate. There's a ton of things he needs to work on. So acting like that guy's just a shoe in thing, let's tank for him. Now, I think Bryce Young is the most one of the most sure quarterbacks we've seen in a while. But still, I mean, there's def- I mean, he's not that big. He, he's, he's short. I mean, there's, there's things, you know, that – these guys, you know, they're going to have issues when they get to the next level that they're going to have to figure out. And, and there's no guarantees that they're going to be able to do it. So I definitely think first two rounds, they have to take it. And then after that, uh, I guess just hopefully they can draft better. I mean, listen, this regime is off to an F minus start. Now it was, it was, they were always, they were always going to have a, a tough time, right? They're always going to have a tough time. They're going to have to undo the, the stuff that Thomas Dimitrov and them kicking the can down the road, fix the cap. They were always going to have to do this. But they have started doing it in the worst way possible. You know, they should have done it originally. They tried to win. Then they get a third round pick for Matt Ryan. The whole Deshaun debacle. Their first draft wasn't that good. They're off to a bad start. There's no if, ands, or buts about it. Now, this is where I think you wipe the clates, slate clean, see what they can do, build from the ground up. But every, you know, move from here on on has to be taken, you know, with a lot of scrutiny. Yeah, I every move from here on out should be held against them. Uh, you know, I agree with you that they're pretty much untying all the knots that Dimitrov tied himself. Um, and now there there's still a couple pieces on the team that aren't there. You know, Deion Jones's contract, that's on them. So don't be mad at them. Uh, but I would argue that basically it, it makes sense, you know, do what the Bills did a few years ago back in 2017. Basically, you know, get everybody out of here. Grady Jarrett's going to be 30. He's going to be on the bad side of 30 by the next time his contract's over. He'll be 35 probably. You don't want to be paying that kind of person over $20 million AAV. Uh, you know, trade Grady Jarrett. He's in a contract year. Get Deion Jones's uh, contract off the books. I mean, you're already at over sixty million dollars in dead cap this year. What's another ten? I mean, it really doesn't matter to me. I mean, you're, we're gonna—they're sh- gonna be shitty this year, no matter what. So yeah, I don't think it does matter. Be, be fully committed or not, you know. I think trading Grady. Yeah, I mean, you wrote that in an article, and I completely agreed with it because trading Grady. While I think Grady is one of the only building blocks outside of AJ Trell on the defense and on the team, really. It, the timeline doesn't add up. I mean, when this team's going to be good, he's going to be on the wrong side of 30 looking for another extension or, you know, getting this fat contract that you've restructured and pushed the can down the road. So the timeline doesn't add up. Uh, get your first round pick or whatever you can get for Grady Jarrett. Um, I know I saw someone say, yeah, I would be calling the Falcons about AJ Terrell. Like, what the fuck? Like, why, why would we, like, of all the players, why would we trade AJ Terrell, the one good player we have, young on a rookie contract, we have them under control for, you know, if you include the franchise tag four more years before we have to convince them to sign an extension. I mean, that's just the most absurd thing. I, and, and then he said for a first round pick, that was the best part about the whole thing. If you don't, if, he's a top five pick right now, dude. Oh yeah, I know. I was just, I, I was, that was so damn funny. I was like, who, why, I mean, I get 
we are a laughing stock. I get we we made it <laughs> for ourselves, but we can't be that bad. We can't be that bad. If that happens, I will, I can't watch anymore. And we got and Terry Vano has to be fired on the spot. I, I I hope that maybe you know the deal the Falcons offered or that they basically had in place with the Texans. I'd like to know what it was, you know, picks wise, because the Browns didn't give up players. They gave up six picks. So, you know, giving up six picks for Deshaun Watson in my head is probably still worth it. But for $230 million, not only are you handy handicapping yourself uh, via the draft, but financially you're also handicapping yourself. I mean, the Browns have a very, very, very thin margin to win a Super Bowl now because sooner or later, Everybody's going to start to get paid in uh, in Cleveland. There's a lot of rookie contracts there that are, you know, they're going to be off the books here in a little bit, and then yeah. they'll also have to pay Deshaun over fifty million dollars. I mean, fifty million yeah. bucks a year almost. So yeah. yeah, I mean, that's a ridiculous contract. I would have liked to seen what the what the contract they have, you know, in place with Deshaun too. Uh, I, it can't be anything near that. No which way. I think the worst part about the deal is that the Cleveland routes came in and did that. It's not that yeah. I disagree with the Falcons not doing it. It's just like, damn, I can't believe they did that. Cause like now we lose and we had them, you know? So I think that's the worst thing about the deal. And I can't really blame Terry Fontenot for that. And I don't really blame Terry Fontenot for trying to go get Deshaun Watson. I mean, I think that's the best thing that's happened to the Falcons in four or five years. Even them, if they had landed them, it would have been. So uh, I don't blame him for that. I just blame him kind of for not ripping this band bandaid off sooner uh, last year. Um, I don't think the draft class is great. And um, you those know are really the two, the you, big you, things. you can't even really blame them though, because you know Arthur Blank hired two guys that had it in their minds that they wanted to compete right away while also rebuilding, and that's exactly what Blank brought in. He brought in guys that would continue to compete. So you know, this is who Terry Fontenot and Arthur Smith are. Yeah. But the buck stops with Blank, and the guys just yeah, don't we don't have to go there. We go there every episode, I feel like. <laughs> it's just, it's not good, man. Blank, uh, he's really showed his ass as an over, owner over the last four well, or five what's years. what's hilarious like- is people are like, he's a good person, he's a good person. Yeah, he's given more to the city of Atlanta than maybe anybody in history, but he's still a shit owner. Like, we can be objective yeah, he's about not a good as an owner. Like, he's not a, yeah, as far as getting this. I mean, I think, really, if you looked up Blank up to that Super Bowl, I would have said he was a good owner. I really think that Super Bowl just like did him a number. I think it like it really changed him. I think it got him a lot more involved. Like he wanted to like make up and get back there so bad uh, that he that he forced a lot of decisions and that really screwed the Falcons. So yeah, I think he's a big reason why this uh, team is where it is. Um, and I think that Super Bowl. I hate to say it, but that Super Bowl had an effect on everyone. And, and you can look at it as Quinn. Um, Ryan, the whole locker room, and also Arthur Blank. Um, And it's crazy. Uh, I think, I don't know who I was talking to about it. I think it was Turner, my roommate, for those of you who don't know. But he was was talking to uh, a pettybone who who used to coach for, like, the Redskins back in the day, and and then his uncle played. And he's like, yeah, man, you don't come back from that. Like, as, as an organization, you don't come back from a loss like that. And at the time, I'm like, that's the, that's stupid. Like, we'll be back. Like, we've got all this talent. And we did go to the playoffs the next year, made it to the divisional round and lost the got the eventual champions, Eagles. But we never really came back from it, uh, um, you know, mentally, um, from an organizational standpoint, from the top down, from Arthur Blank to the players. And now you look at that, the players from that team, I mean, who would have got? Grady Jarrett, Deion Jones? Is that, is that That's it, right? I mean, those Jake are the two Matthews. players. Jake Matthews. I mean, you have three players from from that team. Um, so it's pretty amazing. The downfall. You could make a movie about it. I wouldn't watch it, but you really could make. They a are movie making about a how movie that... about it, dude. They are. Yes, yes. Tom Brady's but, like, making that, a movie. That's, that's from the Brady Brady perspective about him coming back. I mean, there's also the story that needs to be told about how the Falcons completely collapsed after it, and not a lot of people care about that story, but it is an interesting one because it really is from the top down. And it, and it's sad, but it, here we are, and we're at the end of it. And listen, this is this reminds me of where we were before, Matt Ryan. Rock bottom, rock bottom. Bobby Trino pieced out. You know, Matt Ryan's gone. Deshaun Watson fiasco. Hey, we're at rock bottom. Time to start building back up. And if you get the right signal caller, we'll be back sooner soon enough. So ho- hopefully, we find the right signal caller sooner than later. 
Yeah, it's uh, it's uh, it's supposed to be all up from here, but I mean, I'm so it can't, terrified. It can't get that, worse, buddy. Yeah, I'm. But dude, imagine we go in the next. Worse. We go in the next off season, spend a hundred million dollars on free agents, and they don't do anything. I mean, that's the worst case scenario yeah. where you just like get yeah, back. There's to gonna where be a lot were. of pressure, and there's gonna be a lot of pressure on the regime. Yeah, it's it's. So. I mean, they should be scrutinized. Heavily scrutinized for every single move they do from here on out because this is their team. Deion Jones is the only contract really that you know that's bad that's still on the books that's not their decision. And you can get rid of that dude. You like he's not they great, but you can trade that someone. Yeah, you can trade that player. Yeah, I mean, I think both of them. You you got to rip the mandate off completely. I, I I'm completely with you, and I'm sure they will over the next coming days. I don't think we're done. We're, I think, think this offseason is just beginning as far as trades and, and other moves. So we'll have a lot to talk about, and we'll do it when we get back in today in Atlanta.